This time on STV, I get to catch up with an old sled from my past and then get a closer look at it when we run it through Afterburn. I'm really looking forward to that. We also do a little bit of work to the old SRX and I'm going to try out a trick that I found on the internet because everything you find on the internet is true, right? So let's get this show going. STV is brought to you by Yamaha revs your heart. Polaris, think outside. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of pickup trucks for 56 years. Tough, smart, capable. For a lot of snowmobilers, myself included, our passion for snowmobiling started back when we were kids. Now because of that, we may have a special memory of a certain snowmobile from back then. Now it could be the first sled that we can remember riding on, you know, like a squirrel hanging on in front of a family member, or maybe it was the first sled we actually got to ride by ourselves. Or it could even be the after school special sled where the goal was to trample down every bit of snow in the backyard, leaving no fresh snow behind. Now I've got all of those memories all on one sled, a 1980 Skidoo Citation 4500, kind of like this one. But the cool thing about this sled is it's the actual sled that I rode as a kid and it's still in the family, still giving kids their first snowmobiling experience. So my brother Mike is the current caretaker of the old Citation and he's here with me in the shop to kind of take me through sort of where it's at today because this, it is grandpa's old machine but you've had to do some updating to it over time to keep it going, right? Well this beauty deserves all the love it can get, you know. Um, it's had a number of uh, things happen to it but uh, you know we've put a new track on it. Uh, yeah, that was, that was last year you put the new track on. Last it. year it got a new track. Tripled the value of it. Tripled the value. That track is worth more than the full value of the sled easily. <laughs> Uh, got a new windshield this year, really fancy stuff. Uh, the sled usually spends its summers, you know, being used as a, a mouse washroom. Yeah, uh, that kind of killed the last motor, right? Oh, the, there was so much mouse stuff in there that it seized the engine up totally. <laughs> Had to take it right apart and uh, turns out the engine was just, it was done. It, we couldn't salvage it. So this is now the performance model of the, the uh, 4500 because it's no longer the 368.3 cc engine that comes stock in these things. Uh, Skidoo's good. They, th everything throughout the 80s, any engine will bolt into any chassis it seems like. <laughs> so we took a 440 that we found and put it in there and dropped right in, bolted right in, everything just mint. Perfect. Well, and I appreciate the changes you made to keep this thing alive because I think you've had it for a number of years now and yep. you're, you're kind of experiencing the backyard stuff with your girls, towing them around on a GT snow racer and things like that. Yep. I mean, that's that's what we did as kids all the time. Oh, absolutely. But I seem to remember when it when it left here quite a number of years ago now, um, it also had the, the luxurious silver duct tape seat on it. And notice yes. you've recovered it. So that's 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 good. <laughs> uh, I really love this sled. It's, uh, you know, it's got great suspension. You, you've it's, modified the rear suspension by removing the shock. The shock came right out, yeah. It, was was nothing. it no. wasn't doing much anyway. So no. it's kind of like a pogo stick with a track on it now, uh, which makes it a lot of fun to ride, actually. <laughs> Big, thick seat, and you know, uh, it goes fast. Uh, it goes faster than it should, that's for sure. So. Well, with the 440, I'm sure it would. But I mean, this, this is a, it's a great backyard sled. That's what I remember yeah. most, getting home off the school bus, getting out to the back. It, was, it sat outside by the garage, uh, dusted off with snow. And I think I had like three pulls in me. If it wasn't running by the third pull, I, I wasn't riding that day. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. Now, you've also, you're a teacher, yeah. and uh, you've brought this thing into your school on a number of occasions and, you know, kind of working with it uh, with the shop class there, too. That's, that's kind of interesting. You're giving, uh, giving those students a chance to experience snowmobiling maybe for the first time as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it doesn't get more basic than this. Uh, and the kids can, you know, they get in there, they can see clearly what the parts of the engine are and how it works and usually what's wrong with it. And, uh, you know, we spend tons of time in that shop class, taking things apart, putting them back together. And uh, this is... Uh, well, I think the only reason it's running today is thanks to the, 
the lads at school there. Yeah. yeah. The sled that I owned after this one that I that I, I worked all summer for and I was, ended up buying was the 1990 Indy 650, which we've seen on snowmobile or television. And I was riding this sled in the backyard and our, our neighbor had the 650 and I, and I thought I was a boss. You know, I was like, <laughs> this, I, I got the 4500 and it was fast. I mean, I was I was pretty young at the time. And I said to, to Mike, the old owner of the the, uh, the Indy 650, because it had a speedometer and I didn't, and I didn't, had no idea how fast I was going, but I thought I was doing hundreds of miles an hour. <laughs> so I were out in, the, in one of the fields and I'm, I'm doing the full tuck behind the windshield and I've got Mike pacing me with the Indy 650. And again, I, I'm, I'm on fire, I'm going so fast. And I, I can remember the, oh, this is as fast as it goes, we're even going downhill a little bit in the field. And then we get to the end of the field and I'm like, oh, how fast was that? And Mike goes, I think it was about 40 miles an hour. <laughs> that seems about right. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, talk about, like there, I had this big balloon and it just popped, <laughs> yeah. gone. Um, you've liked this sled so much. I love it. I love this sled. You this, actually, this, she's a real beauty. You, but you purchased a second one. I went to purchase a part sled for this one just to make sure I could keep it running. <laughs> Turns out the part sled was in uh, much better shape than this one. So <laughs> we'd be happy to know that we've had this sled in the family since 1980, and just last week we got the ownership for it. <laughs> so I think it's it's almost ready to go on a real trail, which I think is what we have to do. And thanks very much for looking after this sled, keeping it in the family. My pleasure. And it, it is, to me, it is definitely super cool that we've got this sled that's still in the family and and still giving family members uh, snowmobiling experience. So it's uh, it's good times. Coming up after the break, we're going to fire up the old citation for Afterburn. This segment is brought to you by CKX. 1980 symbolized a change in decade from the 1970s, a decade that saw the end of the controversial war in Vietnam, unrest in the Middle East leading to a gas crisis, and then by the end of the 70s, the idealistic dreams of the 60s had all but worn away to a distant memory. The 80s marked a change, Reagan was the new president, and the Cold War was set to a slow simmer. Society was also about to embark on a new MTV era that would see an explosion in home entertainment, and the human race would evolve into something called a yuppie. The 80s also symbolized a change for Skidoo, because they had just retired the old Olympic nameplate from their snowmobile lineup and replaced it with the new and improved Citation. The 1980s Citation's new bodywork was cut with an aggressive wedge angle, smoothed off by centralizing the mass of the headlight back into the base of the windshield. This reduced drag at high speeds. The body lines also featured a facetized design, well ahead of its time. Skidoo wouldn't bring back this design concept until model year 2008. Skidoo also built this bad boy tough, on the bottom side anyways, with a ferrous composite belly pan. Some may refer to this material as steel. The bonnet, however, was made with a glass-like plastic that would crack with just the slightest contact. Age did not help it either. If anything, it's even more brittle now. You really do have to be careful just breathing around this thing. Skidoo continued with the liberal use of the ferrous composite throughout the front suspension. Three leaves of the stuff compromise a thoughtful suspension that's not just simple, but ineffective. I also suppose there's vertical travel, but I couldn't be bothered to measure how much. It's doubtful that the twin tube shocks are doing anything either, but possibly controlling the slap of the front skis, which again are constructed of the ferrous composite. The rear suspension is of a more modern design with the kind of system that can still be found on today's sleds. This setup was coined the torque reaction slide rail, but I'm unsure of where the torque was coming from. Here too, there is vertical travel. How much? Well, let's just say it's enough. The track is also a little shorter than what we're used to now at 114 inches all the way around. 
but despite this, there's still plenty of room on the banana seat for more than one rider. Although it's not too up, there is a handy strap for the passenger to hold on to. Luxury. This sled is also a hybrid because under the seat is an aluminum tunnel that saves weight and doesn't rust. While not new for 1980, the use of aluminum on snowmobiles was set to become commonplace. This might have been one of the last sleds ever to feature the hybrid chassis of aluminum tunnel and ferrous composite belly pan. Under the hood is the beating heart of the 4500. 368.3 mighty cc's of screaming piston port Rotax fury will propel the Citation to unknown speeds. Unknown because there's no speedometer. But then there was also a 3500 version that would take 100 cc's away from this mill. I bet you that was exciting. But for you ballers out there, they had an SS version that would install a second carb on this motor and shorten up the track for even more speed. I bet you that thing was damn near impossible to hold on to. On the snow, there's an enviable 32 and a quarter inch ski stance that's right at home carving corners with just a tickle of understeer and barely any inside ski lift. The suspension is also hard at work suspending. However, coupled with the 12 inches of seat foam and complete lack of speed, the system does a simply superb job at providing a ride. The estimated 134 horsepower, oh, oh wait, I read that wrong. Um, 34 horsepower is a little underwhelming at times while still being enough to be quite terrifying. At least it's fuel efficient with well over 20 miles per gallon, plus the engine is oil injected, very bourgeois for the time. Now keeping all these buff horses under control is a cable operated disc brake, which was an immense improvement over the leather and wood brake shoes found on sleds, only slightly more ancient than the Citation. At the end of the day, my takeaway from the Citation 4500 is that I'm actually thoroughly impressed with this machine. Now, it is pretty fun to go back and poke holes at the shortcomings of these old sleds, but the fact of the matter is, if it wasn't for these old machines, we wouldn't have the modern machines that we ride today. The 1980s were about to see an explosion in snowmobile sales along with the trails to ride them on. Now, there may be a little bit of a chicken or the egg debate as to what came first, the sleds or the market, but machines like the Citation were cheap and easy to own. Plus, snowmobiles were also beginning to shed the reputation of unreliability. Even small details like standard oil injection opened up snowmobiling to new folks looking for a new way to enjoy winters. The Skidoo Citation didn't single-handedly build the modern snowmobile world as we know it, but it, and sleds like it, definitely laid the foundation. For me, if it wasn't for the Citation 4500, who knows who you'd be watching on STV. This segment is brought to you by Woody's. Now Brody and I just finished putting a new set of rings in the old SRX here, but before we go for a full send pass down the ice, we're gonna pull the carbs apart on this thing to make sure that there's no issues, which could lead to a burn down. Normally when I go through a set of carbs, I just tear them down, clean everything up and reassemble. This time though, I splurged on the old sled and got a complete rebuild kit. I'm concerned that after 18,695.9 kilometers and close to 20 years of age, that there might be a few problems in there a simple cleaning may not solve. This kit I sourced from Kimpex comes with everything you need to do a proper rebuild, including all new gaskets, needle and seat sets, even pilot jets for each carb. This type of rebuild is the best way to make sure all the elements of the carbs are performing like they should. Before you get to installing that new stuff, you'll have to do a complete teardown of the carbs. Now there's a bunch of small bits in there that you'll need to keep track of, so take your time. I find having a clean workspace with some fresh paper towel down does help keep you organized. I'll also write down any key info like jet sizes as I go. Now on a multi-carb system, you can choose to take the carbs apart one at a time to use the other as a reference, or you can do like I did and take them all apart and spread them across the table. Now, even though this looks like chaos, it's actually not that bad. I've got everything organized and I know I can get it back together. Now, I do have these things apart as far as I'm gonna take them. My next job 
is cleaning them out. One of the things to look out for on any multi-carb system is different sized main jets from one carb to another. In some engines, one cylinder may naturally run leaner than the others, so to compensate, manufacturers will install a jet of a different size. If that's the case on your sled, getting the jets back into their proper place is key. Otherwise, it could lead to the dreaded squeak. Unless you're into old greasy triples like this or carved sleds, you don't often hear the phrase, squeak the mill. It comes from the sound these engines make as they seize up. For that last revolution before the engine completely stops, you'll sometimes hear this squeak. That would be the pistons squeaking inside the cylinders as they come to this solid stop. Now, if you hear that, it's never good. Modern EFI sleds usually don't have this problem because they're smart enough to know when things are going bad. But older sleds will keep going to the bitter end. Even with properly tuned carbs, it can still happen if one of the carbs ices up or pulls in some water that may be contaminating a fuel system. That's why it's important to treat the fuel system with a de-icer, especially if a sled sits around a lot without a completely full tank of gas. Back to the rebuild. Getting into the small passages that control idle and mid-range carb performance are key to a properly running engine. Often the pilot jets get plugged because they have very small passages in them to control the fuel flow. They're also made of soft brass, so you need to be very careful removing them from the carb body. A properly fitting screwdriver is important because if you round off the slot, you may have just junked the carb. Now the old ones out of the SRX don't look bad, but I'm still gonna install the new ones out of the kit. Now, if you are cleaning them out, some carb cleaner should be enough, but you may also need a small wire or something like that to dig out the passages. Just be really careful you don't damage or oversize the holes in any way. Take your time is a good mantra to repeat to yourself whenever you're working on carbs. So this may sound a little bit ridiculous, but putting the airbox in is actually a pretty critical step. Uh, what you want to be careful of is that the boots that are holding the airbox onto the carburetor, everything is sealed up solid so you're not getting air passing through there. Because if you have the boots aren't lined up and you're drawing air around the airbox into the carburetor, it's a great way to freeze these things up and that can lead to an engine burn down. The other thing to always watch for too is that the carb boots from the carburetor to the engine are in good shape because again, any cracks in there with unmetered air, it's just gonna burn this thing down. With the carbs rebuilt and the new rings in the SRX, it's almost ready to hit the ice. The last job is to replace one of the exhaust valve cables, which was broken off inside the guillotine housing. The little nubbin on the wire rope cable failed right at this connection to the valve, so it wouldn't move with RPM on the mag side cylinder. I'm not sure how much power and top speed this one problem killed, but I'm thinking that this old Yamaha might just end up being faster than the SCSI. After all, at this point, it's only got to go 104 miles an hour to match the speed of the Mach. After installing the rebuild kit, I've got everything back to stock jetting in the SRX, because it looked as though somebody had installed an aftermarket jet kit into this thing, making the carbs a little leaner than stock with smaller than normal pilot and main jets. Now, I'm okay with lean, because lean makes power, but knowing this thing is headed to the radar run, I'm more than willing to give up a little bit of speed and a little horsepower on the top end to keep this thing safe at speed. Coming up after the break, I'm putting the water trick to the test. I gotta go pee now. This segment is brought to you by Ford. For the next job on the SRX, well, it's more of an experiment and less of a job. You see online, I found this thing called the water trick for getting your primary clutch off. And what it does is use compressed water to pop that thing off or uses that compressed water for those times you don't have the proper clutch tool to get it off. Seems to work, so I wanna try it. First, I wanted to talk about why clutches are so hard to get off. And it's because of this taper right here. There's one on the end of the crank and there's a corresponding one on the inside of the primary clutch. 
Now there is a bolt holding it together, but it's just the taper and the taper alone that's transferring all the power from the engine into the drive system. There's no spline, there's no keyway, it's just the taper. Even with the bolt removed, you can't break the two tapers apart by hand. You need something mechanical to push them apart, like this removal tool. Now there's tools available for every combination out there. They're also inexpensive, but you do have to have one on hand. They work by bottoming out the crank's bolt hole and then forcing the clutch off as they thread into the center bore of the primary clutch. It's this mechanical forcing apart that pops the clutch off the engine. Now to show you just how hard a taper can hold, if you come to the lathe. Inside the tailstock, there is a taper in here that holds a tool with a corresponding taper to it. Now to insert it with just a light little bit of pressure, I can't, I can't get that thing out of there. And just like a snowmobile clutch, there's no spline or a keyway holding it in place, it's just the taper. Now to get this out of there, again, it's mechanical. There's a push rod in here, let's back that off, push rod hits, taper comes apart. Here is where the water trick comes into play and this is how it goes. First, you'll need a bolt that'll thread into the primary clutch only. Then you need to wrap the threads in Teflon tape to make sure you form a watertight seal. Next, get the sled on its side. Next, take the bolt out. Then fill the hole with water. That's full. Then thread the bolt into the hole, trapping some water inside. Then tighten the bolt to build pressure. And there we go, it's science, it works. Getting to spend some time on that old Citation 4500 was a heck of a lot of fun in this show, so I think we're gonna have to see that thing back again. Until then, keep your BR9s lit. Closed captioning is brought to you by Yamaha. STV has been brought to you by CKX, wear your passion. Schaefer's, specialized lubricants since 1839. Best Western Hotels and Resorts, ready to get away? 